Hi everyone, David Pecker here. And in this video, I would like to discuss what is energy. Now, a lot of people say that they get energy by drinking coffee. So, is energy what I get after I drink a double espresso? Or perhaps energy is what I get after I eat a bowl of cereal? While the coffee certainly gives me emotional energy, the bowl of cereal actually gives me chemical fuel. And that is potential energy. So the second one is really quite a bit closer to the definition of energy in science r rather than the first one. So kidding aside, what is energy in science? In science, energy is a quantitative property which measures how much work can be done. Now to get a better feel for what is energy in science, Let's take a look at a couple of examples, starting with potential energy. Suppose I want to lift a mass up to a certain height. Now, I would imagine everyone would agree that lifting masses upwards it does indeed require work. So here I have a height h and a mass m, and I want to set the mass m on a ledge height h above the ground. Now, how much energy do I need to expend? Well, scientifically, energy is force times distance. So it's mgh. Here, mg is a force of gravity acting on the mass, where g is acceleration due to gravity in Earth's field, and h is the distance that the force acts over. Right, so delta e, the energy I need, is force times distance, which is the amount of work I need to expand to lift up the mass against the force of gravity. Now I want to remark that in science, if you apply a force but do not move an object, then you're not doing any work, right? Although you might think that you're sweating because you did not apply a force over a distance, you didn't actually accomplish anything. Now, what are the units of energy? Well, we have force times distance. Now, what are the units of each? Well, force has the units of newtons or kilograms meters per second squared, which is equal to uh, units of mass times acceleration. And distance, of course, has units of meters. Putting these two together, we get units of kilograms meters squared per second squared. Now, for our second example, let's take a look at kinetic energy, or energy of motion. Suppose we take our mass and go ahead and drop it. Now, when we lifted the mass up, what happened is we did work against the force of gravity in lifting the mass. When we allow the mass to drop, the force of gravity does work on the mass. So it takes the potential energy of the mass and go ahead and it converts it into the motion of the mass. Now, because of energy conservation, what we have is all the potential energy of the mass ends up being kinetic energy of the mass. In other words, by dropping the mass, we are converting its potential energy into kinetic energy or energy of motion. Now let's try to figure out the formula for kinetic energy uni using unit analysis. Right, what is our goal? Our goal is to achieve something that has units of energy, which means it has to have units of kilograms, meters squared per second squared. And what are we allowed to use? Well, we, we have to do something about motion. So we should have the velocity, which has units of meters per second, and we also have the mass, which has units of kilograms. Now, how do we combine velocity and mass to make something that has units of energy? So let's write down the formula for EK, E kinetic. Well, let's start with the mass, right? Our uh, answer better have uh, kilograms, so we need a factor of mass. And we also need a factor of meter squared per second squared, which we can obtain from, from velocity squared. Now, this formula has the correct units, but it's not exactly right 
it needs an extra factor of one half. Now to figure out this extra factor of one half, unfortunately I really should use calculus. And since I promised not to use calculus in this class, you're just going to have to trust me on this factor. Now so far our examples have been pretty much standard textbook examples. Let's do something a little bit more rocket related. Let's think about converting the potential energy of chemical bonds into the kinetic energy of rocket, uh, uh, of rocket exhaust. And specifically let us focus on liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen rocket engines. So these engines take two molecules of hydrogen, 2H2, and one molecule of oxygen, that is O2, and convert them into two molecules of water, 2H2Os. Now I take a look at my handy dandy chemi chemistry reference and figure out what are the binding energies of these three molecules of hydrogen, oxygen and water. So looking this up, I find that the binding energy of hydrogen is 4.52 electron volts. The binding energy of O2 turns out to be uh, 5.15 electron volts and the binding energy of H2O is 9.566 electron volts. Now these are not things you ever need to remember because you can always look them up in your chemistry reference. What does binding energy mean? Let me draw an energy diagram. So here is my energy axis, upwards is higher energy, downwards is lower energy, and here is zero. Now for reference, as zero energy, I will use the energy of two well-spaced hydrogen atoms. Now hydrogen atoms actually want to bind into hydrogen molecule, into H2. And therefore a hydrogen molecule is 4.52 electron volts lower in energy than two well-separated hydrogen atoms. So the binding energy is how much energy you gain when you let the atoms bind into a molecule or in other words, the binding energy is how much energy you need to apply to a molecule to tear it apart into its constituent atoms. Oh, and what are these funny units of electron volts? Well, these are also units of energy, just like kilograms meters squared per second squared, and they correspond to the kinetic energy that an electron gains when it, when it is accelerated across a potential of one volt. These are typically units used for, uh, for measuring energies of uh, atoms and molecules because the quantities, as you see, are uh, nice and small. So one electron volt is ra roughly corresponds to the binding energy of a typical molecule. Now let's go ahead and apply energy conservation to our chemical reaction in which we convert hydrogen and oxygen molecules into water. We start by writing down the energy of the two hydrogen molecules. And because this is a binding energy, we get a negative sign, right? Because uh, uh, the molecule has lower energy than the individual atoms. So we get minus two times 4.52 electron volts. Then we add the binding energy of uh, oxygen, 5.15 electron volts. And on the other side, we have the binding energy of water plus the thermal energy which is released in the reaction. Our goal now is to solve this equation for the thermal energy, for Et, to figure out how much energy is released in the combustion process. Now combining the left hand side, we find that the binding energy of the reagents is 14.59 electron volts. So we are going to go ahead and write that down. Next, we look at the right-hand side and we find the binding energy of the two water molecules is uh, 19.132 electron volts. Next, we are going to take this energy and bring it over to the left-hand side to leave the, just the thermal energy on the right-hand side. So we get plus 19.132 electron volts and that is equal to the thermal energy Et. And here I made a slight oops, checking my notes, I see that that 5 should have been a 1. 
Okay, fixing the calculation, I can now write down that ET is going to be equal to 4.942 electron volts. And that is for two water molecules. In other words, burning two hydrogen and one oxygen molecules produces two water molecules plus 4.942 electron volts of heat energy. Now, what would be the exhaust velocity if I could convert all that heat energy, ET, directly into kinetic energy, EK, with 100% efficiency? Well, this smells a lot like the challenge problem on homework 5. So what we need to do is we need to write down the thermal energy, the 4.942 electron volts, and set it equal to the kinetic energy of the exhaust gas, 1 half mv squared where here the mass is the mass of the two water molecules, 2 times MH2O, because we get two water molecules for each reaction. Now to solve for, for velocity, I multiply both sides of the equation by 2, and then divide it by the mass M, and finally take a square root. Doing the Gori uh, arithmetics, I find that the velocity is 5145 meters per second, which is pretty fast. Next, I convert this number into specific impulse by taking the velocity and dividing it by g, by 9.8 meters per second squared, and I arrive at a specific impulse of 525 seconds. And this is a maximum theoretical specific impulse that can ever be achieved in a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen uh, rocket engine. Now let's compare our maximum theoretical estimate to a real rocket engine. The space shuttle main, uh, main engine produced a specific impulse of 450 seconds, which is really not bad especially considering that the space shuttle main engine needed to operate all the way from, uh, from Florida, which is at sea level, to the vacuum of space. Now let's look at the final example of energy, and that is escape velocity. In other words, how fast does a rocket need to go in order to completely escape from Earth's gravitational influence? Now, in order to make progress, we need to know what is the gravitational potential energy at different distances away from the center of the Earth. Now, again, this formula is pretty straightforward to derive, but it again requires calculus. So, let me just go ahead and write down the formula. The gravitational potential energy is big G times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the spacecraft divided by the distance between the spacecraft and the center of the Earth, the little r. Instead of proving that the formula is correct, let's at least check that the units of the formula are correct. Now, big G times the mass of the Earth, the mass of the spacecraft, divided by r squared, that's the universal force of gravity. So it has the units of force, or newtons. Uh, newtons, as we remember, are kilograms meters per second squared, or mass times acceleration. Now, what about our formula? Uh, big G times uh, mass of the Earth, mass of the spacecraft divided by R. Well, we can just take the units of force and multiply it by meters. So we get kilograms times meters squared per second squared. And those are indeed units of energy. Check mark. Now, to get a better appreciation for this formula, let's go ahead and plot it. So, on the vertical axis, I, I plot the gravitational potential energy, E graph, and on the horizontal axis, the distance between the spacecraft and the center of the Earth. And the green line represents the gravitational potential energy. And I see that the closer I am to the, to the mass, the lower is the potential energy. And let me insert the word gravitational potential energy. Now, what does this li green line represent? This line represents that the closer I am to the mass, the more work I have to do in order to extract myself away from the mass and move myself out of its sphere of gravitational influence, 
out to r going to infinity. Which neatly brings us to the question of escape velocity. In order to escape the gravitational potential, what I need to do is I need to provide enough kinetic energy to be able to break free. And the closer I am to the mass, the smaller the r, the more kinetic energy I need, as the gravitational potential energy becomes lower and lower. So let's go ahead and sketch out the problem of the escape velocity and then do a quantitative calculation. Here is the Earth and we have our spacecraft starting on the surface of the Earth. So for us little r is the radius of the Earth. And what we want to do is to give our spacecraft enough velocity so it escapes off into infinity, completely moving out of the Earth's sphere of gravitational influence. So what is our initial state? Right after the launch of the spacecraft, our total energy is composed of the gravitational potential energy E grav plus the kinetic energy E k, which corresponds to the spacecraft velocity. Now what is the final state of our, of our spacecraft? Well, the spacecraft has reached deep space and therefore it no longer has any uh, gravitational potential energy since it's so, so far away from the Earth. And in principle we don't require it to have any kinetic energy because once it gets so far away we're okay if it has com come to a complete stop. So the total energy of the spacecraft in the final state should be zero. Now the law of conservation of energy tells us that the initial energy must equal to the final energy. Therefore the initial energy must also be zero. Now adding up the potential energy minus g times m earth m spacecraft divided by r and the kinetic energy the one half mv squared that uh, the two should add up to zero. If we set the initial velocity of the spacecraft to v escape the escape velocity. We divide uh, both sides of the equation by the mass of the spacecraft and it makes sense that the uh, escape velocity should not depend on the mass of the spacecraft which is much less than the mass of the earth and we go ahead and take the uh, one half v escape to the left side and put the g m e over r to the right side, solve for v escape by multiplying both sides by a factor of 2 and finally taking the square root to obtain the formula that the escape velocity is equal to 2 g times the earth's mass divided by earth's radius little r. Notice that this, uh, this answer is square root of 2 times the orbital velocity. So if we can make our spacecraft go square root of 2 times faster than its orbital velocity, it will not only be able to go into orbit, it will be able to entirely escape the uh, Earth's gravitational influence by going off into, uh, into deep space, uh, in other words, very, very far away from the Earth. And indeed, every single spacecraft that we sent off into deep space for example, to go visit Ma Mars or Mercury or Jupiter needs to have a, a velocity at least as high as, uh, as the escape velocity. Otherwise, it will never be able to get out of the Earth's gravitational sphere of influence. Indeed, humans have managed not only to get spacecraft to break Earth's escape velocity, we have also managed to make spacecraft which travel at faster than the escape velocity of the Sun. Indeed, these spacecraft, Voyager 1 and 2, Pioneer 10 and 11, and the New Horizons spacecraft, which is not shown in this picture, are headed out of the solar system and into st interstellar space. I hope that this video has elucidated the concept of energy in physics and science a little bit more and also explained what exactly is escape velocity. Thank you for watching and remember to stay curious.